The Bounty Hunters He gives his cybernetic arm a slight shake and glares down at it. The hand is deformed and ruined. He runs Axiom down it so visibly that electrical arcs race across his arm as the metal pops back into its proper place and configuration. So, is someone going to explain just who or what killed Target Actual before we could properly question her? In our defense, there's supposed to only be a story. A legend, Newitt says, and Pukey turns around to look at her staring right at him. Am I really going to have to prompt every little part of this conversation? They're supposed to be stories. You take away everything a woman has and she'll go hollow to get you back. Don't push too far or the hollow will come. It doesn't matter how much a killer costs, they're cheaper than the hollow. That sort of thing. Nui explains, they're not supposed to be real. Assassins that kill at least twice with every contract, their employer and their target, doing that to them. Vexa explains, stepping out of the interrogation room and pointing back in. I've never heard of anyone ever drawing blood on them. You got her twice. Wasn't good enough. I didn't sense any axiom as she slipped away with that smoke thing. Pukey notes as he steps back to the interrogation room and his eyebrows go up to see what happened to Iva Grace. The body looks like it's had 10 years to desiccate. There's also a strange thinness to her, as if more than just the water was removed from her body. He's willing to bet a lot more was missing than just the fluids. And whoever called that killer here is also going to kill it this way. Yes, and sometime later she's going to show up as a hollow herself. Charming. Are we going to see her again? Pukey asks. No, they fulfill their contract and leave, Vexa answers. If the contract is fulfilled, she mentioned collecting, but there have been times where, after getting their payment, they decide to be thorough. When adds in, great, so we have a super assassin that can do all the Axiom bullshit without actually using Axiom. Any idea how that was done? That's what makes them so scary. The more you use Axiom, the easier they get you. If you want some unstoppable adept to die in a hurry, then the hollow make it look easy. That explains why she was so surprised to get those taps. They vengeful? No, but like I said, occasionally thorough. If you're neither the target nor an ally of the target, then you're safe from them. Wentz says, I see, looks like this is Lytha's and Bikes show then. If you'll all excuse me, I need to organize around this catastrophic breach in our security and make one scary report back to the Dauntless. Yes, sir. Galactic boogeymen, non-axiom, magic assassins called the Hollowed, or the Hollow Daughters. Pukey confirms a while later. Most disturbing. Now the field is breaking down, the dispatcher asks. It is. If things continue at this rate, it will be completely down before tomorrow. However, before she was executed by the Hollow, Target Actual said there was more, everywhere. And what is the likelihood that it was her being sexual? Dear God, I hope not, Pukey says in a disturbed tone. But aren't you good for Kobe loving? The dispatcher mocks. Try to keep this professional sahib. Hey, that's our word for white men, don't use it. He protests, and Pukey just lets out a groan of annoyance. Anyways, we're organizing relief efforts for the planet Albrith. We're including a detox team to look at the environmental implications of you dumping literal tons of mustard gas onto some mountain-sized bioweapon sitting in the local water table. Are there going to be repercussions for that? Pukey asks, worried about his crew. We're already poring over legal precedent for the acceptable use of force. If all else fails, then Admiral Cistern is willing to take the full blame. Even if the rest of the galaxy disagrees, you boys did good work in a shit situation. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. The dispatcher replies and Pukey nods. Good, good. I've got my people going over all of Iva Grace's stuff to see if she kept any notes or had any properties where she might keep a journal or something. 
If nothing else, you should be able to confirm her movements and find out if that threat of there being more weapons was a serious one. I hope not. The idea of the woman upping herself from the mountain-sized face with tentacles is bad. It's going to take weeks in a dedicated space dock to fully repair the chain breaker, and the local one is massively understaffed after all the horse shit that Target Actual pulled. Are you still capable of movement? Yes, but nearly a quarter of our weapon arrays have been sheared off or separated from the power grid and the collateral caused several shield generators to go critical. The creature must have had some minor obsession with symmetry, which slowed it down because we've got a huge V-shape carved into the ship from the bastard. Atmospherics are thankfully uncompromised, and the ship is still space-worthy. I just don't fancy our odds in a fight anymore. We went from hilariously over-armed to slightly above average in one fight. I don't like that. I'd imagine not. So no matter what you're sticking around that area, even if just to repair your boat, Yes, sir. All right. There are some fairly well-used Axiom lanes that get into that general area. Reinforcements should only be a week out at most. Right. That's enough time to rack up a few more war crimes while I'm at it. Pukey remarks, and there's a snort of amusement from the dispatcher. All right. Hold tight and best of luck with the hunt. Thank you. I think we're going to need it, Pukey remarks. You know an investigation is off to a roaring start when you can't stop cracking your head against the low-hanging ceilings of an absolutely tiny house. We should just take this place apart and go through all the pieces. The hat mutters as he picks up his Carnex leather hat again. In all fairness, we should have expected this. She was experimenting with bio-nightmares having her personal residence below legal height requirements is such a small thing by comparison. Mr. T begins and the hat snorts. Right. Well, pun aside, if someone's already committing murder, is it really a surprise if they jaywalk? Fair enough. The hat mutters as he scooches into the next room and starts reading off the titles of her books. But I think we would be better served if we just loot this place down to the foundations and sift through it all back on the ship. Probably. But after everything that happened and all the shit Grace put them through, the people are really, really skittish. So we need to at least try to be subtle and dignified about things. Mr. T notes. So the two biggest members of the crew are sent to find clues in a house owned by a being so small that she doesn't have to bend down to bite your dick off. The hat says bitterly. Thank you for that mental image. You know sometimes. Hello there? Mr. T begins and then stops. He had been checking drawers by pulling them out and then placing them back in, but the one he had pulled out was sitting off the table he was at. Find something? I believe I have. Mr. T continues as he examines the bottom of the cutlery drawer to find a pair of data slates velcroed to the bottom of it. She's hiding things on the underside of things. Hmm, something I'll have to look for. The hat remarks as he starts shifting things around a little more. She has a lot of paper books. Kind of odd for how the galaxy prefers data slates. We may have to grab all of them. If they're just books, then they might be interesting to read through. If they're part of some insane code, then we might get something more out of them. Mr. T explains before his communicator goes off. Tea time? Are you both still at Target Actual's house? Bike asks. Yeah, finally found something too. Why? Her car is on the move and heading your way. Get ready. Bike answers. Well, fuck. Let's get outside so we can actually move without potentially destroying information then, the hat says. And in short order, both men are outside the tiny house and stretching. I still say we should just take it apart and loot it all down to the foundations. I'm starting to agree. The only person we have the right size for that house is Cindy, and she's not a field of girl. Mr. T remarks passing the second data slate to the hat. He pockets it as Mr. T pockets his. Then they wait. They're not left waiting long as a mini air van swoops in, and there's a clear hesitation from whoever's in it to come out. Then the door opens and a tiny half-grown cobe comes out. 
Her resemblance to Target Actual goes beyond uncanny and into the straight-up cloning territory. But she's even smaller, perhaps prepubescent, far too young to drive. If she's actually young, healing comas muddy the waters quite a bit. Who are you people? She asks. Who are you? The hat returns and she seems taken aback. Um, well, I, uh, I asked you first, she states. Call me Mr. T. This is the hat. What do we call you? Are those your real names? She asks. There are field names. What's yours? I don't have a field name she says, and Mr. T resists the urge to facepalm. Then what do we call you, little lady? Mr. T asks, and she looks nervous. I, what are you doing here? She tries to change the subject. What are you doing with Iva Grace's vehicle? The hat answers, and she suddenly looks panicked. Over the next three seconds, a lot happens. The girl jumps back into the minivan and takes off. Both men dive forward, and as Mr. T grabs onto the rear bumper, the hat grabs onto him and they start going up. It takes all of five seconds for the hat to climb onto the top of minivan using Mr. T as a ladder. The girl's scream is at a pitch so high that a dog would whimper in pain to hear it. She immediately loses control of the vehicle and it slams into a large tower and then starts spinning. The hat rips out the door grabs the terrified Cobe and leaps away from the minivan as Mr. T lets go and makes a safe landing even as the minivan crashes into the side of a building and the hat lands on the ground unhurt. And she fainted. Lovely. The hat says holding her up by her armpits and she's just hanging loosely. So where's your money? Daughter? Sister? Mr. T asks, walking up to the hat. Maybe a clone. Still, we'll know when we get her to Cindy. The hat answers. I got her. You want to toss the wreck? Yeah. I may as well do something useful while we wait for evac, Mr. T states. I think you're right, though. She's got everything that Target Actual had detail-wise, just in miniature. And things just got more complicated. Although, to be fair, we should have expected more normal clones scurrying around. The hat says as he starts hold the tiny half-grown cobe like a baby and follows Mr. T to the car. She wakes up to a stark white room. That's normal. But the bed she's on being so huge she can't reach the sides of it? That's not. Oh, you're awake. You gave us quite the scare there when you just fainted dead away. How do you feel? Is there any pain or numbness? A voice asks, and she turns to regard a mountain cobe approaching with a pleasant smile. That the doctor is another cobe puts her at ease in many ways as she closes her eyes and considers. No, no pain or numbness. I am a little hungry, however. She answers. Of course, you poor dear. You've been out for several hours. I'll have something sent up. Do you have any preferences? The doctor asks her, and her face lights up at the prospect of choosing her own food for once. Fish, well, fried in oil, she says, and the doctor nods. We have a lovely dish called fish and chips, a bit on the big side, but it's easier to deal with having too much to eat than not enough, the doctor says, and she nods if only to get at the fish. Whatever the chips are, they can go rot. She's getting some fish. The dish is sent for a while later. A young Nagasha man with some clear augmetics brings in a trolley with delicious smelling food. And the food. A large platter filled with what look fried tubers and what are clearly large chunks of fish deep fried in oil and it smells heavenly. There are two more cobe sized plates to the side and a container with a spigot for water. I missed a meal of my own, so I hope you don't mind if we eat together, the doctor says. Really? What's been happening that's kept you so busy? Well, not even half an hour ago, this room was nearly full. I only finished cleaning when you woke up. The doctor explains, and she would swallow if she had enough spit. Was there a fight? She remembers being attacked by two gigantic tret, likely of Canador descent, and everything went dark as she tried to escape. Um, mother, can I go now? the Nagasha asks, and the doctor nods. All right, be back later. Your son works at the hospital too. Hospital? Oh no, 
You're on a spaceship. We have some questions for you, but we don't want you hurt. We're not your enemies, and I'm afraid two of our soldiers made a bad first impression. Soldiers? She asks. This is bad. Very bad. Yes, but don't worry. My job is as a doctor. I'm on your side. So long as you're in my infirmary, you're safe and no one will hurt you, she assures her. But she has a hard time believing the woman. She's not so hungry anymore. 